Well, praise the Lord, it is Wednesday night at 7 o'clock p.m. Central Standard Time, and that is the time that we have set aside for our weekly midweek Bible study. We invite you to join us now for a time. Um, this week I'm going to be doing something different than I normally do. Um, next week we are going to begin a series of Bible studies in which we will be looking at uh, Bible passages that are commonly used in opposition and in condemnation of LGBT people. Um, I can assure you that uh, after many, many years of life in ministry, I finally took the time to investigate these things for myself. And I'll tell you what, you'll be shocked at what you're going to learn. What is commonly presented to us is not at all factual and truthful. So we are going to be... Uh, looking at, for instance, Romans chapter 1. We're going to be looking at the Levitical law. We're going to be looking at um, the story of Sodom and Gomorrah in Genesis 19 and other places. And we will begin that next Wednesday night. Tonight, however... I felt led of the Lord. You know, I touch on these things sometimes uh, during the course of our Bible studies. I've talked about some of these things a little bit. But tonight, I feel like uh, we need to have what I am calling a prophetic conversation. What I mean by a prophetic conversation is this. I am going to share with you this evening uh, many of the things that God has shared with me in the prophetic over the last several years concerning uh, the state of our nation, concerning the situation that we're in at this time, concerning situations that the church finds itself in now. When I say the church, I do not mean our church, our one local church. I mean the church of Jesus Christ universal. I see the church as something of a bullseye. You've got the center of the bullseye is the smallest, and that is the group that is the closest to the whole truth of God as revealed in His Word. The Word of God said, Many are called, but few are chosen. And the truth of the matter is that there are many who identify as Christian, but the vast majority, not, not a large portion, the vast majority of those who identify as Christian, um, their doctrine and their belief systems are, quite frankly, more inaccurate than they are accurate. And then as you kind of go in on the bullseye, you know, from the outer circle, you go in and you, you get more and more clarity, more and more accuracy, uh, more and more correct teaching and proper doctrine. And then finally, of course, you have that hole dead in the center. Um, I like to think that we are in the uh, center of the bullseye. I realize uh, that people who are in the outer rings are going to say, no, we're the center of the bullseye. And those who are on the furthest out rings are going to say, no, we're the center of the bullseye. But uh, the Word of God said, let every man be convinced in his own mind. So what's important is that you know in your heart 
that you are hungry for and desirous of the pure, unadulterated truth of God's Word. And, uh, you know, I've said many times, I was looking this week, somebody had on their Facebook page uh, a little meme that had something to do with, uh, oh, how was it worded? I can't quite remember how it was worded now. Tell you, don't get old, folks. It's not fun. But uh, it was in a similar vein to what I often say. And what I often say is, you don't ask questions when you think you already know the answers. As long as you think you know the answer, then you never ask the question. And the Word of God promises us, Ask and it shall be given unto you. Seek and you shall find. Knock and it shall be opened unto you. The problem is, most people who identify as believers do not ask, do not seek, and do not knock. They think they have the answer. Uh, if they have a question, instead of going to the Lord and asking God about it, they go to their pastor. And of course their pastor is going to give them an answer that's in keeping with his doctrinal position. And uh, so if you, know, if you get a Baptist person, and they say, you know, to their pastor, is this baptism with the Holy Ghost real? Uh, with the initial evidence of speaking with other tongues? Of course he's going to say no. And he's going to twist and pervert uh, Scripture to make it say what he wants it to say until he convinces you of his position. If you're genuinely hungry, for the truth of God, the word of God said, but the anointing which we have received of him teaches us all things. And we have no need that any man teach us. The spirit of God is present to teach you and to lead you. Jesus said the Holy Ghost, the spirit of truth, would lead us into all truth. So if you have a question, you should not go to someone who you know from the get-go is going to have a bias. You need to go to the Lord and seek the Lord concerning that. I've told this story before. I'll tell it real quickly again before I get into my prophetic conversation tonight. I have a great aunt who was born and raised in uh, Europe, she was, I believe, German, but she had left Germany and gone into a neighboring country during the course of World War II, and that was where my uncle found her. He married her, brought her back to the United States, and while she was here, uh, she began to attend a Baptist church. And uh, my grandmother and my family had come into the Pentecostal faith, had received the gift of the Holy Ghost, and uh, she would occasionally visit their church. And she told me, she said, man, I loved the people at your grandmother's church. I loved the enthusiasm and the joy and the positivity in that church. She said there were many, many things there that I really loved. And uh, she said, but I couldn't quite wrap my head around the baptism of the Holy Ghost. And so uh, she would go to her pastor at the Baptist church and she'd ask him about it, you know. And of course, every time she'd ask him about it, he told her, no, that's not for today. Oh, that's, you know, that, blah, blah, blah. And he had all kinds of explanations. Well, finally, one day, my aunt was sitting in the Pentecostal church. And uh, she decided that she was going to ask the Lord about this because she finally got to the point where she wasn't satisfied 
with the answer that the pastor was giving her. Just something just wasn't ringing all together right. She said, I need to hear from God on this. I need the Lord to answer this question for me. And so she said, I prayed silently. And I said, Lord, if this Holy Ghost baptism and speaking with other tongues is real, let me hear someone speak in my native tongue, German. Well, she said she no sooner said those words than this lady in the church jumped up and started worshiping God. And she said, and she was doing it in perfect fluent, uh, fluent German. And my aunt even began to tell me some of what this lady was saying because it was literally, a, you know, a phrase in German. And, to, and my aunt in her 90s remembered what this lady was saying that day. And she said, but the thing that really made it astounding was that the woman who had jumped up and started speaking German, she said she was an Italian woman, and she had a very difficult time speaking English because her Italian accent was so heavy as she would try to speak English. And my aunt said, and here I knew this lady. I talked to her many times. She didn't know anything about German. She said, and then... All of a sudden, she jumps up and she's worshiping God in fluent German. And she said, and this woman had no accent. She said she didn't. Her, her German was absolutely perfect and on point. And my Aunt Betty had said, well, Lord, I guess I've got my answer. And she turned around and right then received the gift of the Holy Ghost. And she herself begin to speak with other tongues as the Spirit of God gave her the utterance. So, you know, if you have a question, folks, you need to go to God about it because the Lord is the one who will give you an honest, straightforward, unbiased answer. All right. I want us to pray real quick as we open our time together this evening. I've already taken some stuff, but I'm still having a little bit of trouble here. Let's pray together tonight. Master, we love you, God, and we thank you for once again an opportunity to come together as the people of God to discuss the Word of God, to be benefited by fellowship, Lord, by the communion of the Holy Ghost. We ask God tonight that every individual participating in this conversation would come with an open mind and an open heart, prepared to hear what the Spirit of the Lord desires to say to the church at this hour. Master, today, speak to us, O oh God. Instruct us. Help us to know the path that we ought to take in this difficult hour, for we ask it in none other than Jesus' wonderful name. Amen. Praise God and amen. I want to start out this evening by saying I am well aware that many people who hear what I'm about to say are going to discount it. They're going to find every uh, reason in the world not to accept or believe what I'm saying as being from the Lord, that's fine. Uh, like the Apostle Paul said, let the deceived continue to be deceived. Folks, people, the Word of God said in the last days that God would turn them over to a reprobate mind so that they would believe a lie. If you are satisfied believing lying spirits, if you're satisfied believing false doctrine, if you're satisfied believing false prophets, then God is going to let you just sit there and simmer in it. Um, because God doesn't fight people to follow him. The Lord does not 
struggle with you to force you into compliance. That is not how God works. Walking in relationship with the Lord is always voluntary, always. Walking in the Spirit, learning to walk in the Spirit, learning to walk by faith, that is always voluntary. God never, ever, you know, this notion that every time you step out of his path, you know, he sends down destruction and all kinds of negativity. That is a lie from the pit of hell because that would be the Lord trying to force people, as it were, uh, to walk in his ways. He doesn't do that. He never did that in the Old Testament with Israel. He would warn them when they were going off track. He would warn them when they were not doing right and they weren't acting right. He would warn them of uh, potential dangers that were going to arise from their conduct. He would allow them at times to go into periods of, of uh, captivity and all this sort of thing. And really what it amounted to is the same thing in today's world. Uh, the Lord said, hey, listen, as long as you're willing to walk with me, I'm willing to lead you. But if you want to go your own way, I'm going to let you go your own way. The only problem is whatever comes with your going your own way, you're on your own. See, a lot of people love to ascribe to God that he was constantly punishing Israel over and over again for their various misdeeds, you know. No, it wasn't so much that he was punishing them as he was simply allowing them to reap what they had sown. He was saying, okay, you know, you you want to do things without me? Fine, I'll step back, get out of your way, and let's see what happens when I'm not there protecting you. Let's see what happens when I'm not there guiding you and guarding you. Do you follow what I'm saying? And then he promised in prophecy, he would say over and over again, uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get back on the scene. You know, I'm going to come back on the scene. I'm going to rescue you. Once you got yourself in trouble, once you put yourself in a mess, I will come and I will rescue you and I will return you and restore you and help you. Uh, because again, God is not a punitive God. So it's important to understand that. <sighs> Getting into our conversation this evening, the United States of America is in a terrible state of affairs today. I prophesied years and years ago, to give you an idea of the exact time frame, uh, George W. Bush was running for his second term. When I preached a message in our church that was titled, The Man Who Would Be King, in that message, now when, when was George, I, I meant to look that up earlier because I couldn't remember the exact year and all that. Uh, it should have been, I think, 2004, if I'm not mistaken, but I might be wrong. Uh, so because he would have served 2004 to 2008, and then that's when Obama came in, and he was there to 2012 and then 2016. So I believe it would have been back in 2004. And uh, I preached then, and I said then in the church that there were white supremacists in this country who were waiting in the wings, just waiting for an opportunity to rise up and to bring about a second civil war based on race in this country. I said then, furthermore, the Republican Party has turned against the Constitution. They no longer have any interest whatsoever in the Constitution. 
They get up, they put their hand on a Bible, and they lie when they uh, swear allegiance to their Constitution. I said then, they have no use for the Constitution. The first opportunity that arises that would allow them to discard the Constitution altogether, they will do it. I said then, they want to install permanent Republican leadership in this country. They want a dictator. They want an oligarchy, meaning they want the country to be run by a small group of elite people, which is themselves. And this small group of elite people would, of course, be very wealthy, very rich people. And they want to establish an oligarchy. They are presenting to the religious right that they are interested in a theocracy, meaning a government that is run hand-in-hand uh, hand with the church. But what the religious right doesn't know is that they're not even remotely interested in, <laughs> in, in a theocracy. No, 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 no. They specifically want an oligarchy. They want their little group of rich men to run everything and to dictate everything. And they want a dictator, somebody who will be a figurehead and do their bidding. I said then that they wanted George W. Bush to be that man. However, George W. Bush did not have the stomach for it. It required that, it would have required that he be willing to literally discard and, and disavow the Constitution altogether. And George W. Bush may have had a lot of faults, but folks, you've got to give him credit. He couldn't do that. He couldn't go that far. And so their plan was thwarted. Then Obama came on the scene, which just blew everything out of the water because now these white supremacists, these racists, have a black man in the White House. That is their greatest fear. That's the biggest terror that they have lived with for decades. And Obama being in the White House made them realize we are going to have to step up our plans. We are going by hook or by crook. We are going to have to get in position to discard the Constitution and establish a oligarchy headed up by a dictator as quickly as we possibly can. Donald Trump came on the scene at the exact right moment. Being the lying, deceitful, greedy, evil, empathyless, compassionless uh, man that he is, he is more than willing to do everything the Republican Party has wanted to do now for decades. Unlike George W. Bush, he doesn't have a problem with any of it. And many people in this country, and I've been saying this since Trump started running for president. Tommy could tell you I was saying this while he was running the first time. I said, there are, the, the media and pundits keep trying to suggest that, oh, Donald Trump 
is an aberration, you know, oh, 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 he's just, you know, really upsetting the boat. And people are just going along with him because they're afraid of him. No, 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 no. That is not what's going on. He is doing exactly what they have wanted to do for decades. They are fully complicit. They're behind him 100%. This notion that, you know, he, oh, he's doing all this on his own and he's upsetting the apple cart all by himself and, oh, these Republicans, they're just not standing up to him like they should. No, 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 not at all, not at all. They knew that he was upsetting half the population just by reason of, of the way he conducts himself and the way he acts. And so during the first election, they were playing this little game. Let's act like we don't like the way he talks. Let's act like we don't like the way he does. and act, We don't like the way he behaves and blah, blah, blah. Because that way, he can look like the bad guy too. The Democrats, and we at least can look like, you know, we're still reasonably decent people. But the minute he got elected, they all jumped right in behind him, and every step of the way, for four years, every step of the way, they defended him, they exonerated him, if they truly had disagreed and been disgusted with the way this guy conducted himself. They had two impeachment opportunities. And twice, twice, they let this guy off the hook. Don't tell me they're not complicit. They are complicit. But I know this not because I have some secret insight into what's going on in Washington today. No, I know this because the Lord showed me decades ago that this was their ultimate plan. This was their ultimate end. This is what they were going to try to do. And folks, if that man gets reelected, they will succeed this next time around because he is not going to need the support of the religious right. The minute he gets into the White House a second time, if God forbid that should happen, he's not going to need the people he needed to get elected. And Narcissists like Trump, I know because I grew up with a pathological nar narcissist for a father. People like him, the minute he no longer needs you, he will turn against you. And I guarantee you, the religious right has been playing with fire for decades. And they don't know the hell they're going to unleash on their own heads if they somehow are able to get this man back in the White House for a second term. Ronald Reagan was one of the most popular presidents in modern times. Many Democrats supported Ronald Reagan um, just because they thought he was a nice guy and, you know, and he, there was something about him that uh, spoke to people. He was a wonderful communicator. When he made speeches, they didn't sound like the retarded babblings of an imbecile like Trump does. Ronald Reagan, he spoke, and his words were so inspiring and so uplifting and so patriotic, you know. And uh, so he moved people. And Ronald Reagan used to tease about uh, a constitutional change so that he could run for a third term. 
but he was teasing because obviously he would he didn't make any effort in the universe to run you know to change the rules so he could run for a third term and uh, but you watch and see if Trump is to get into the White House the Republicans are going to do everything necessary to make certain that they have permanent control. People say, yeah, but Trump's an old man, so what difference does it make? Even if he set up a dictatorship, how long can he live? Folks, you don't understand the nature of dictatorships. Dictatorships are about dynasty. Therefore, if he establishes a dictatorship, if he establishes himself, as it were, in permanent presidency or permanent power, then on his death, one of his sons would immediately just step right into the role. There'd be no election. There'd be no, none of that foolishness. The son would just step into the role and take over where daddy left off. That's how dictatorships work. Look at the situation in uh, in Korea. You know, look at, uh, historically, look at the dictatorships around the world. That is how they work. Now, I want you to understand something. Now, one word that I'm saying is politically motivated. Now, one word of it has squat to do with political positions or, um, you know, planks of, of a political party's platform. Uh, I don't care about those things. The United States of America was very uniquely created by our founding fathers, a constitutional republic, a constitutional democracy, Many people on the right, you know, love to uh, make a point of the fact that we're a republic, we're not a democracy, as if there's, you know, some enormous difference. Um, I'm sorry, sometimes I just go so irritated with stupidity. These dingalings don't realize that a republic is a democracy. A republic is a a form of democracy. You have de a pure democracy would be where every single issue, every single uh, item that comes up in society and every single law, every single everything is voted upon by the masses and majority rules. That's what democracy means, majority rules. A republic is a form of democracy, but it is a representative democracy, meaning we don't vote on every single issue and every single law. Instead, we vote on representatives who go to Washington and represent us and they vote on these matters on our behalf. That is what a republic is. It is a representative democracy rather than a pure democracy where the people would literally vote every single item, every single law, every single issue. Obviously, uh, you can't really run a country as a pure democracy uh, because just just think about the mechanics of trying to arrange a vote every single time you know uh, you, the president or Congress in, in introduces a new law or introduces a new rule and the people have to vote on it you know uh, so our founding fathers established a constitutional uh, republic meaning a representative democracy, okay? This form of government that was created by, by our founding fathers works. Our government works, and it works exactly 
as it is meant to work. The problem has been that society and the world is changing. And as society and the world changes and becomes more liberal, as it were, uh, you have this segment on the right that is having a fit because they want to force everyone into compliance with their point of view and their beliefs and their convictions, okay? And so what happened is when Fox News was created, it was created to be a propaganda network. It literally was created to serve the purpose of feeding the population with right-wing propaganda. They blow everything up and make something out of nothing. Everything, everything, everything. They keep those on the right in a constant state of fear and panic. Not because of what is actually happening 95% of the time. But rather, they say, because of where this move is going to lead and that move is going to lead. They always are preaching the notion of a slippery slope, a slippery slope. I get such a chuckle. I actually had a guy bring me my medicine uh, the other day. I, my uh, cancer medicine is delivered by courier. And the guy who delivered it, we were kind of talking at the door for a minute. And don't you know, he kind of got a little political. And he started saying some stuff. And, of course, he doesn't know my position. But he was talking conservative idiocy. Absolute stupidity. I didn't say anything to him. I'm not gonna, I told you, I'm not going to argue with stupid people. I don't have time for it. You know, he was going down this rabbit hole about, well, you know, they want to turn America into a, into a socialist country. <laughs> oh, really? And what is a socialist country? Tell me, pray tell. Well, nobody owns anything. You don't own your own property. Blah, 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 blah. Uh, wrong. That is not a socialist country. That is not a socialist form of government. Wrong. Go read a book. Go get an encyclopedia. Go open a dictionary. That is not what a socialist country is. A socialist country is where all the means of production uh, in a country are operated under the auspices of the people, of the government. In other words, you would not have private electric companies. You would not have private gas companies servicing your homes. You wouldn't have, uh, you know, private utility companies and private phone companies. No, all of these things would be run by the government. That is a socialist government. That is what socialism is. What the Democratic Party and the liberals in America are trying to do is not even close to being socialism. Now there are some, like Bernie Sanders, and I think he cuts his, his nose off to spite his face by uh, actually espousing the word socialist, you know, calling himself a democratic socialist, uh, because really he's doing the same thing the Republicans do. He's misusing the term socialist. He doesn't even know what socialism means. The concept of socialism is everything that the people of a nation require ought to be pro uh, produced and provided by the government 
so that uh, they're not being gouged and they're not being, you know, overcharged and overpriced by greedy corporate interests, okay? I'm not saying that's my position. I'm saying that is what socialism says, okay? You need electricity, you need water, you need gas, you need utilities, you need phone service, you need medical services, you know what I'm saying? All of those things in a socialist uh, government are controlled and operated by the government. That's not what the Democrats are trying to do. The Democratic Party is saying there are certain things that we believe are essential to the promise of the Constitution that every man, every person, every boy, every girl has the right to life, uh, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. If everybody has the right to life, while they're sitting there preaching that women who become pregnant ought to be forced to have babies because after all, that baby has a right to life. Why then does it not stand to reason that medical care ought to be something that we as the people of America should be interested in making sure that all of our fellow citizens have, because after all, you have no right to life if you don't have enough money in a country where medical care can put you into bankruptcy. It's a pretty simple principle, isn't it? It's not hard to understand. That is the democratic position. What it boils down to, my friend, is this. Democracy, or I should say American democracy, works when people of goodwill utilize the system as it has been designed. I was Republican for many years. I was Republican even after I came out. I never officially joined the log cabin Republicans, but I technically was, in effect, a log cabin Republican. I used to watch, for a while, I used to watch uh, Rush Limbaugh. And Rush Limbaugh didn't take me very long of watching him. And I'm smart enough to know that as I watched him, it was kind of like going to church every Sunday and hearing the same sermon, you know. Every time you turned him on, you were hearing, the sky is falling, the sky is falling. Oh my God, our whole country is collapsing. Oh my goodness, everything is falling apart. Oh my Lord, the Democrats are out to destroy us. Every time a Democrat was running for office, Rush Limbaugh and Fox News would tell us, they're going to come for your guns. Every time there's an election, every single time, there's an election, and a Democrat wins. This literally happens in America. There's a run at the sporting goods stores for ammunition. Every time, folks, how do I know? I'm a gun owner, okay? I know. Trust me, I know. Every single time. And you'll hear the same foolishness every time. Single time. We well, gotta buy up all the ammo you can buy now because them Democrats are gonna be coming after our guns. They said it going back way before Clinton, way before Obama, way before Joe Biden. They've been saying this over and over and over and over and over again every single election cycle, and the poor pea brains on the right keep buying it every single time. Where is the evidence that they're going to do this? 
when have we once seen a Democrat, even when he had control of the House and or the Senate, when have we seen them come after our guns or come after our ammunition or try to change things so that you no longer have the right to bear arms? If I say you have a right to own a gun, that doesn't mean you have the right to own a tank. That doesn't mean you have the right to own a projectile uh, weapon, you know. That doesn't mean you can own missiles. You cannot, in this country, you cannot privately own any type of nuclear device. But we've got people who want to act like if we limit the type of weapons that you can have so as to prevent people who, who are dangerous from getting hold of weapons that are capable of killing many people in a very short period of time, that that is tantamount to them coming for our guns! idiots. I own property in the mountains <coughs> out of state. Tommy and I keep talking. We talked about doing some hunting and stuff. We've got rifles. We've got stuff. You know what? I don't have a single uh, automatic Rifle. I don't have a single gun that can shoot 30 bullets in 20 seconds. Sweetie, if you hunt with a weapon like that, you're either a miserably ridiculous shot or you're going to find out real fast that whatever you kill, you can't eat because it's going to be so riddled with bullets and so tore up that the meat isn't going to be any good to you. Nobody hunts with an AR-15. Nobody hunts with a machine gun. Nobody hunts with an automatic weapon. Just doesn't work that way. The right to bear arms for self-defense, uh, uh, and the way that the Constitution is written, it, it says plainly, although it's ignored, that the right to bear arms is in conjunction with a well-regulated uh, militia. Meaning, if it is necessary for citizens to be called together to defend our nation against an imposter or an intruder, or someone invading us, then it is important that the citizenry have the ability to possess arms so that if they are called upon to defend the nation, if they're called upon to defend against invasion, they have something to use to defend themselves. Okay. That doesn't mean you have to run around with automatic weapons. That doesn't mean you have to run around with machine guns. That's ridiculous. It's insane to believe that the citizenry should have access to the same identical types of weapons as the military has access to, or even, for that matter, as law enforcement has access to. But then, also in this country, what people don't realize is Again, I'm speaking prophetically tonight. I want you to understand. Everything I'm talking about is stuff the Lord and I have talked about. There are bad actors in this world who for decades have been going out of their way to make the radical right in America uh, distrusting of our government to make them fearful and afraid to divide us to stir up angst between us 
Abraham Lincoln said it, and it is no less true today than it was when Lincoln said it, and Lincoln was quoting Jesus. A house divided against itself cannot stand. The division in this country, the fact that there are people in this country who are willing to sell themselves over to so much anger, to so much angst, to so much distrust, to so much anxiety, to so much fear, the fact that we have a large number of people in this country who are willing to do this is the biggest threat to our national security that exists today. China is less a threat to our national security than is our own division. Russia is less of a threat to our nation today than is our own division. There was a time in America where even politicians, sometimes they jab at one another. I remember, I'm old enough to remember when uh, Ronald Reagan was in office, you know, and he would sometimes take a jab in jest, more or less, at liberals or Democrats, you know. But for the most part, regardless of which side of the aisle you were on, basically the argument was always framed, well, we have a different view of the role of government. We have a different view of what the government can do within the framework of the Constitution and what it cannot do. We have a different view of what kind of a role government should play in people's lives. The thing that annoys me most about this country is people love to use the word government as if it is some entity off here somewhere in the boondocks. No. <laughs> We're a constitutional republic. Do you know how to define the word government? The people. Abraham Lincoln said a government of the people, for the people, by the people. In America, the word government is synonymous with the people. So if the government provides services. It is we the people providing those services. If the government is providing the means whereby everyone has access to health care, it is not some benevolent entity over here somewhere. No, that is born of the compassion and the benevolence of the American people. We as a people feel compassion for our own. We as a people want to provide for the health and well-being of our fellow citizens. We as a people want to help to provide for the education and the success and achievement of our people. So the term government in America means something very different. And if you would just contemplate every time you want to use the word government, if you would just insert the word people, we the people, it'll help you to understand how America works. Our democracy works. The form of government established by our founding fathers through by reason of the Constitution works. When it's working, but it is not bringing about the results that the right wants, all of a sudden the right starts screaming and hollering that our government doesn't work. 
If you say our government is not working and doesn't work, my friend, you are literally saying that our Constitution is faulty. That the government provided for by reason of our Constitution does not work. We have an entire segment of the American population today that for decades has been preaching that exact message. What does that tell you? I told you, the Lord told me years and years and years ago, He told me, He said, the Republicans don't have any use for the Constitution. They, they don't want anything to do with the Constitution. As it is written, the Constitution is a very liberal document. It's a very liberal document. It, it does not use constrictive language. It does not use confining language. Nowhere in the Constitution do you read, if there is some group of the population that is engaging in conduct that is a threat to the morality of our nation, thus and so should be done. You don't read that in our Constitution. No. Our Constitution basically reads that every individual is supposed to walk in liberty and freedom to do and live as they please so long as their conduct is not endangering or harming or taking away from their neighbor or their fellow citizen. But because the world is changing, our nation is changing, because the outcome of any number of uh, decisions that have been set forth by federal courts and, uh, and the Supreme Court don't agree with the beliefs of the right, all of a sudden we're to believe that the Constitution doesn't work, that our government doesn't work. The, the form of government established by our founding fathers They'll try to say, oh, it's been corrupted. It's been... No, it hasn't. No, it hasn't. It has been working exactly as it was designed to work. And the Word of God said, God sets up kings and establishes councils. It is God who determines who's in charge at any given moment. And that includes when Obama wins. And that includes when Joe Biden wins. It always cracks me up how the right loves to talk about when their guy's in office and people on the left are up in arms, you know, and the right says, oh, well, you know, God's in control. It's God who determines. But boy, let somebody get elected they don't agree with, and all of a sudden that passage is nowhere near their thinking. All of a sudden they, they never contemplate that passage for a single moment. But the reality, folks, is our system works exactly as it was meant to work. The outcomes in many instances have not been agreeable with the religious right. And I'm specifying the religious right, and I'll tell you why. I, I told you I was Republican for the whole first part of my life, my voting life anyway. I've spoken to more people, like when I drove Uber and stuff, I've spoken to more people, and you'd be shocked how many people I've talked to who have said to me, well, you know, I vote Republican, but I only vote Republican because I believe in uh, lower taxes and less regulation. And blah, blah, blah. I could care less about abortion. 
I could care less about restricted gay rights. I could care less about social issues. I could care less about this, that, and the other thing that the religious right is all inflamed over. I, I, I can't even count how many people have told me that literally over the years. I've had people tell me, oh, I'm pro gay rights, you know, I'm pro choice, I'm pro this, I'm pro that. But I vote Republican for, and it's only for the fiscal policies that the Republican Party claims to espouse. Of course, what makes me laugh is these people who only vote for the Republicans because of their fiscal policy, um, do they not ever open their eyes and wake up in the morning and, and see that every time a Republican is in office, their so-called fiscal policy goes out the window. They never, ever, 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 ever live up to their own claimed fiscal policies. Never. They never have, and they never will. Because that is all a sales pitch. Just like the religious right, excuse me, the Republican Party using... Uh, gay rights and gay issues and uh, and uh, abortion as the battle cry. Those things, just like the fiscal policy things, folks, those are all just key phrases that stir up people and secure their vote. And nobody on the right seems to have enough sense to watch and look and see that this party that claims to be so concerned with this and this and this, and yet every single time they're in office, they never do one single thing, never, not one time, that is in keeping with these issues they claim are so important to them. The only time the Republican Party is interested in uh, reigning in spending is when a Democrat's in office. When a Republican's in office, hey, baby, spend away. Whatever you want to do, doesn't matter to us what you want. You want to spend money on a wall on the southern border? Go ahead, honey. Spend billions of dollars on a wall. Because after all, we know that there's no such thing as airplanes. We know that drug cartels and wicked people haven't been digging tunnels for decades that lead from Mexico to the United States. We know that people who are up to no good are going to be hampered by a wall. Dear Lord, they won't ever be able to get past a wall. Oh, Lord, no! A wall? That'll stop them for sure! Idiots. <coughs> but they're willing to throw billions of dollars into these ideas. They're willing to become fearful. They're willing to become terrified. They're willing to become full of anxiety at every turn. And this is where God is displeased. God's people are not motivated by fear. Jesus talked about in the last days, he spoke of the signs of the time and uh, events that would transpire, things that would happen in the last days. And the Lord said, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. So when these things happen, don't be afraid. If we really believed God, if we really walked by faith like we claim to walk by faith, 
then you would not see the level of division in this country that you see. You would not see people embracing the conspiracy theories that you see them embracing. You would not see the um, battles over social issues that you see being engaged in. What most of these people on the right do not take into account is the simple fact that things that are happening today have been happening for many, many, many decades. You got people on the right, for instance, in certain states who seem to think that drag performance just started yesterday. Really? The earliest days of television, Flip Wilson, Milton Berle, they performed in drag. Everybody thought it was the blast. Everybody thought it was hysterical. The reality is the world in which we live today is we are exposed to so much more of what goes on in the world around us than we were 40 years ago before the internet and what have you, okay? Before the internet, there was all kinds of stuff going on that we just simply had no knowledge of. We had no exposure to it. And honestly, honestly, I'm going to say this, we were better off for it. Because if you were a right-wing nut job who wanted to live your life in a bubble and didn't want to know nothing about the evil that men do, you could live like that. You could live your whole life and never have a clue what was going on in the real world. And that probably was better off for all of us. There's a lot of people even in the on the left who seem to think that somehow or another society is served when we force people to see things, when we force them to look upon things. Well, they just need to get used to it. They need to get used to seeing gay men kissing. They need to get used to seeing this. They need to get used to seeing that. No. That is, that is not a good, that is not a good technique, folks. That's not a good tactic. That is not a good approach to take. You know, I always say, if you want to make friends, the best way to make friends is not to walk up to somebody in a raincoat and flash them. That's not a good way to make friends. You know, the reality is many human beings just simply cannot digest, they cannot handle certain things being in their face all of a sudden. And if we approach things wiser, if we approach things with more wisdom and more intellect, if we weren't trying to be so forceful in our approach, and we allow people, because I'm going to tell you, the, the more people become exposed to certain issues, especially at a personal level, the easier it is for them to come into a better understanding and a better position on those issues. Meaning, the same people who you try to force certain images in front of them and they get up in arms, the next thing you know, they're voting for the most homophobic politician on the planet, and the most anti-gay, and the most racist, and the most lunatic politician that ever lived. Those same people, if you weren't forcing those images in front of them, but you are allowing them in whatever amount of time it takes. See, this is the biggest problem in America. People are impatient. They want everything to change tomorrow when the reality is that is not 
how the most lasting change occurs. Don't believe me? Look at what happened in this country when Donald Trump was sitting in Washington. Man, you never saw breaks go on so hard in so many people's lives. You never saw folks throw their brain into reverse and go back a hundred years as fast as they did as when Donald Trump was in office. Why? I'll tell you why. Because they were forced to accept change. They were forced to look at things that they were not ready to look at. Now, if they were looking at that and it were their grandson or their granddaughter or their niece or their nephew or their son or their daughter, it might have had a different impact on them. But a stranger on television or a stranger on the Internet, no, they have no vested interest in that person whatsoever. Therefore, anything and everything that person does is going to be offensive and harmful to them. They're gonna, it, it, it's going to trouble them and it's going to push them into action. The biggest problem that we have had in the LGBT community, I'm going to say it, and I know a lot of people disagree with me, I don't care. I have never seen activism that lacked wisdom like I've seen it in the LGBT community. Man, we've got the... the some of the folks in our community hadn't got enough wisdom that God gave a fruit fly. You've got to approach things in such a way that you're being effective. You've got to approach things in such a way that uh, people are able to receive and able to contemplate and able to digest what it is you're showing them and what it is you're trying to convey to them. There are ways of doing that. But we've got people in our community. I said it years ago. Everybody was just nuts over Will and Grace when Will and Grace came on TV. And I said... I told Tommy, we've been together 22 years, I said to him, I said, do these people in our community, do they not realize that 90% of the jokes on Will and Grace are based on misconceptions about the LGB community? They're based on prejudices they're based on ignorance. They're based on uh, wrong thinking. Most of the jokes on that show are made, listen to me, at the expense of LGBT people. And I'm not saying I didn't like the show for what it was. And, I mean, we watch it and we laugh at certain things because we understand the stupidity and the ignorance of what's being said. But when Archie Bunker and all in the family came on back in the 70s, I'll tell you, the black community was up in arms. Black activists were up in arms. They were very disturbed by the way things were said. They were very disturbed that jokes being made that capitalized on stereotypes of the black community. I remember as a kid watching, uh, even on the news, there'd be activists that would come on and they would talk about how in the movies and on television, uh, black actors were always playing certain roles. They were always playing criminals. They were always playing drug addicts. They were always playing pushers, pimps, and prostitutes. 
And black activists back in those days used to really make a point of, we are not happy with this. We don't like this. This needs to change. Where was anybody from our community speaking up about Will and Grace and saying, hey, when you're making jokes about somebody being gay because their mother was overbearing or somebody uh, being gay because they had a bad relationship with their father, every single character, every single character of Will and Grace, every single one of them, had serious psychological issues. If you look at them from the standpoint of a psychologist, you would honestly have to say every single character on that show was psychologically screwed up out of their mind. Will screwed up out of his mind. Grace screwed up out of her mind. Jack screwed up out of his mind. Karen screwed up out of her mind. Will's mother screwed up out of her mind. Do you, do you follow what I'm talking about? Every single character. Why were the networks more than happy to support Will and Grace being on the air? I'll tell you why. It didn't offend anybody. Why didn't it offend anybody? Because all the jokes were made at the expense of LGBT people. All the jokes were made using all of these ridiculous preconceived notions about LGBT people. All these stereotypes, all the, every single laugh come out of a stereotype, come out of a, something that the right believed. And when you've got LGBT people being portrayed on a show and they're saying the very things that right-wing anti-gay fanatics believe with all their heart. Of course you're not bothering them. You're not offending them in the least. They're sitting there saying, see, see, even they know it. Even they know they choose to be gay. Even they know it's a screwed up mother who messes her son up and turns him queer. <coughs> Look at Jack. He's got a stepfather who's loving and supportive and tries his best to be there for him. And yet he just constantly talks about his stepfather like he's abusive and mean and terrible. Do you see what I'm saying? Do you understand, Tommy? Do you understand what I'm talking about? I used to watch that. Jack's stepfather was a perfectly nice guy. Tried to be there for Jack. Same thing with, uh, what was his name? Vince, Will's boyfriend. Vince's father was a perfectly nice guy. Tried to be supportive of his son. But how do they portray the relationship? Vince thinks his father is constantly coming down on his head. Vince thinks his father is constantly being negative and condemnatory. Psychologically damaged. Every single character on that show was portrayed as being severely psychologically damaged. And we sat there and laughed along with the right. And the right was laughing for one reason. We were laughing for another reason. But nobody in our community ever stopped to think, wait a minute, do we want anybody laughing because the joke is on us? All right, I'm going to sew this up today. I've just been venting on some things. I want to sew this up. Our nation is in deep trouble today, folks. I've been warning for decades. Before Obama left office, I said in Dallas, Texas, I told our church, I said, we are about to see all hell break loose in this country. 
as Obama leaves office, things are going to get bad. I said, I don't know what else is going to happen. There's going to be violence. There's going to be a lot of bad stuff going on. I don't know how long it's going to last. And I do not know if when the smoke clears, we are still going to be a constitutional republic. I was saying that before Obama left office, and I was I was saying it loud, and I was saying it a lot, wasn't I, Booby? I was screaming at the top of my lungs, people, you better wake up, because things are about to get bad. Things are about to go in a very bad direction. And I specified, I specifically said, as Obama leaves office, everything is just going to turn sour. It's going to go in a very bad direction. Folks, as a child of God, we have no business stirring up angst. We have no business encouraging division. We have no business um, doing anything but trying to promote peace and understanding between people. Jesus said, Blessed are the peacemakers. The Word of God said, We've been called to the ministry of reconciliation. As God's people, we ought by nature constantly to be trying to uh, bring people to a state of unity, to a state of compassion, to a state of understanding one another. The fact that the church in America, the evangelical church in America, has not been doing this, the Spirit of the Lord told me years and years ago, he said, much of the coming persecution that is going to fall upon the church in America especially, he said, is going to be their own fault. It will be self-inflicted. They've brought it upon themselves by reason of their own conduct and their own actions because they're not doing things the way I would have them to do things. And if they would do things the way I would have them to do things, America would be the last country in the world where Christians would experience any form of persecution. The only countries in the world that Christians ought to experience persecution in are countries like the Middle East and the Far East, where uh, they're a minority religion, you know, and there are other religions that dominate. In America, that shouldn't even... <laughs> We shouldn't even know what religious persecution looks like. But we're going to know, and we're starting to see it more and more now, and it's all because of the conduct of the church. All the wounds that they're about to experience are self-inflicted. They've brought it upon themselves. We need to be able as Americans to look at one another and realize, you know what, you're a person of goodwill, I'm a person of goodwill. We may disagree on the role of government, we may disagree on specifics, you know, on how things ought to be done or what things ought to be done uh, by the people, for the people. But we are people of goodwill. And in the end, our system of government works. And when things work, but they simply do not produce results that are favorable to our thinking and our position, that does not mean that things are not working.
So we need to be very careful. And as we approach this next, next election season, I'm going to say this as plain as I can say it. If you think for a second that Donald Trump is a good choice for America, honey, there's something desperately wrong with your head. I have never in my life seen a man that has so many demons running loose in his skull as that man has. I literally cannot, literally cannot even sit for two minutes and hear his voice on television because I am so vexed by the demonic influences that I feel emanating off of him that I, I can't I can't even listen to his voice. I literally, Tommy will tell you, I gotta change the channel as fast as I can change it. If I'm watching a program that I like to watch and they start talking about him and all that, the minute they start showing clips of him saying something, I gotta change it. I, I can't I cannot listen to that voice. That lying spirit, that deceptive spirit, that greedy spirit, uh, that vulgar spirit, that hateful spirit, that uh, th th there are just so many things pouring off of that guy that I just feel like I've got a bunch of lizards crawling all over me and I can't, I can't deal with that. And like the Lord said to me the other day, as I was driving from here to Huntsville or from Huntsville back home, I can't remember which now, but he said, do you think that the righteous are in such short supply that I would have to tap somebody like Trump in order to get somebody to do what I would have them to do? He said, no. That's not the case. There are plenty of people who are in public service who strive to do right and try to act right and behave right and live right and do right. He said, no. He said, the problem is the church has decided that it knows what I want done and it's doing everything in its power to make happen what it has decided I want done. When in reality, I have not spoken. I am not directing anybody to give those directions. God has not spoken to anybody and told them in truth that abortion is the biggest issue in America today. That is the biggest pile of manure that has ever been preached in a Christian pulpit. I grew up in a fundamentalist Christian church. You know what I was taught growing up as a kid? Every baby that dies automatically goes to heaven. Hallelujah, glory to God. They haven't reached the age of accountability. Really? So all these children being aborted according to fundamentalist and evangelical teaching are automatically going to heaven. Oh, but we're supposed to give them an opportunity to live. Why? So they can go to hell. Because the majority of them are going to wind up lost if they are born. The majority of them are going to wind up lost if they wind up being born into this life. What a terrible thing. You think God is going to stand there and tell people if in fact all these children are going straight to heaven? You think God's going to stand there and tell people, oh, you need to make sure these babies are born. Hallelujah. You need to make sure these children are born. If they're not born, it's the biggest evil. That's right. That doesn't even make any sense. But we've allowed a political party to so brainwash the religious right has, allowed a political party to so brainwash them, to define terms, to establish priorities, to create all these false 
equivalencies and all these false um, priorities. We've allowed a political party to dictate to the church what the most important issues in our society and in, in our world are. And then the church stands there and tries to act like, oh, we're in control of it, bless God. The church informs politics. Politics doesn't inform the church. Baloney. Baloney. Forty years ago, do you know what the position of evangelical and fundamentalist Christianity was on the issue of abortion? <laughs> it wasn't anti. That position changed. Much, much to the credit of a certain uh, Jerry Falwell and his moral majority movement, who was trying to politicize the church. So therefore, we had to create an issue, we had to have an issue that could be presented as spiritual and religious in nature, but that had to be addressed within the realms of the political. And that's what they did. And so all of a sudden the position changed. All right. I'm going to close with this. God's people are called to be peacemakers. God's people are called to love. We are called to bring uh, harmony and unity. We are not called to divide. We are not called to stir up angst and negativity. Folks, we've got to appreciate that our form of government works. Even when the outcome is not altogether what we'd have it to be, it works. The problem is much of the advances, much of the progress that we would like to see takes a long time. That's part of the process. One of the reasons that that is, and I promise I'm closing up right now, one of the reasons that that is the case is because we are not a monarchy. We are not a dictatorship. So we don't have just one person at the top of the heap who can change the rules or change the law at a moment's notice. That is why the founders designed our government the way they did, and that is why they designed it so that change oftentimes does tend to take a pretty good while to occur. But when you allow change to occur gradually, when you allow it to come more organically and naturally, Ultimately, in the end, it will have greater longevity and it'll survive the test of time. If you try to force it and push it upon people, it's going to go out the window at the first opportunity they have to discard it. And that's what we're seeing in America today. All right, anyway, I'm not sure I, I did very well sharing anything I was thinking. Oh, but uh, anyhow, next Wednesday we are going to begin to look at uh, LGBT issues and uh, affirming theology. We're going to look at passages that deal with um, what are commonly referred to as clobber passages, uh, those that are used by uh, professing Christians against LGBT people. And uh, so I hope next Wednesday night you'll join us for that. And I don't know how many weeks we'll devote to that, but I'm sure it'll be a good number. So we'll be doing that for a good while, okay? All right, let's just pray before we close, as we close. Master, once again, God, we thank you for this opportunity to come together. 
Lord, our nation is in great distress right now. Division and strife and negativity and angst are dominating the landscape. And much of that is due to the conduct of people who call themselves Christians. The Lord, you said, you shall know them by their fruit. And Lord, if a tree does not bring forth good fruit, it is not a good tree. And not everyone who cries, Lord, Lord, is going to enter in. And just because there are some today, Lord, who profess Christianity, that does not mean they possess Christ. And Lord, today we ask God that you would help us to be peacemakers, that you would help us to be agents of reconciliation, that you would help us today, God is your church, to encourage people to understand one another, to accept one another, to live in harmony, to be unified, Lord, as a nation, as disunity and division weaken us and make us vulnerable. And as you declared, Lord, no house that is divided against itself is capable of standing. Master, in the name of Jesus, I don't know, Lord, if I didn't just ramble tonight, but I pray, God, that something I said will some way have a positive impact in the thinking of individuals who might be watching at this hour. Help us, Lord, to understand constructively what it is tonight that I've been talking about. And help us, Lord, to take these words and to turn them into some positive and constructive conduct and behavior. Master, go with us from this place, O oh God. Keep us always in your care. For we ask it in none other than Jesus' wonderful name. Amen. Okay, folks, I hope we'll see you Sunday at 3 o'clock Central Standard Time for a celebration of life in Christ. And then, of course, next Wednesday night at 7 for our midweek Bible study. In the meantime, as always, God bless you in Jesus' name is our prayer.